Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Natalie Loney, and I'm the Community Involvement Coordinator for the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. I work for the EPA, so I guess I work for you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out um, to this town hall meeting. We're going to be talking about um, the Gowanus Canal Superfund site, a little bit of its history, um, and, and where we are in terms of the cleanup. Um, and, and to start the evening off, um, uh, Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez has some, some words of inspiration for all of us, and I'm going to turn the floor over to her. Um, following that, you'll hear from our new regional administrator, Pete Lopez, and then the presentation can start. Um, so I'd like to um, ask that you hold all the questions until the end of the presentation, and then we'll have an open floor for, uh, for question and answer, all right? Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And good evening everyone, it's so great to come home. I just landed, literally. Uh, it took me an hour and 20 minutes to make it here. But uh, this um, kind of turnout is really inspiring because we have worked so hard to get to this point. So let me first thank uh, appropriately some of the people who have made this happen. The Gowanus uh, Wyckoff uh, Garden, uh, Ms. Bell, thank you so much for facilitating this room. And um, I would like to also uh, thank our host, uh, the Gowanus Canal Advisory Group, CAG, for pulling this event together, and also the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Thank you so much. And I want to uh, recognize our local uh, elected officials, my uh, colleagues in government, uh, Assembly Member Joanne Simon. I believe that uh, Senator Belmanet Montgomery is not here, but Oscar Jonas is here representing her. Thank you so much. And maybe, um, um, I just want to try to see, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I said, um, Councilman Brad Lander might be uh, coming in. I want to really thank uh, the EPA staff, Region 2, that has been great partners uh, in this uh, journey. Uh, EPA Region 2 Administrator, Pete Lopez. Um, <laughs> Super Fund Director Walter Mottam, <laughs> Gowanus Project Manager Christo Siamis, <laughs> there is a lot of love for you here, <laughs> Natalie Loni, <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> and Carson Mara. And I believe that there are some uh, staff or representatives from state and city agencies. Thank you, because the cleanup and restoration of the Gowanus Canal is not only an effort uh, and undertaken by the federal government, but it takes a whole village to make this happen and to make it happen the right way. So from DEP to DCP to all the agencies that have been uh, partners in this uh, undertaking, I want to thank you. So we are at a stage where what we have been working for for so many years, um, many of the people that are here, some of them that are new, uh, do not know the history as to that brought us to this point. So I would like to give you some historic perspective so that you value, especially in the climate that we find ourselves in our nation, uh, the important role of community engagement and community participation and processes that are driven by the community because after all, anything and everything that happens in our communities, major projects, should reflect the vision of our community. 
And I believe that that is the most important legacy that we can all aspire to. So like many of you here today, I have been working on this issue since 2000, specifically seeking to deploy federal resources to remediate the canal. I remember 17 years ago hosting a press conference and boat tour. We brought the Assistant Secretary of the Army, the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, and local elected officials. Senator Velmanet Montgomery and former Councilwoman um, John Millman were with me at that boat tour. I wanted for everyone, I wanted to call attention to the canal as to how polluted and contaminated the canal was. That tour focused attention on the canal and two years later, the city and the federal government entered into a cost-sharing agreement for a $5 million restoration feasibility study to be conducted by the Army Corps. I was kind of naive 17 years ago. I thought that, well, if we want to dredge the canal, let's bring the Army Corps. So I went back to Washington, I secured some money, and we then funded this feasibility study. Well, we found out that the level of contamination and pollution and the level of the dredging and capping and everything that needed to happen in order to remove all the contaminants and to turn this canal into a jewel that we could all be proud of required more than just a bunch of engineers and um, heavy equipment to dredge the canal. It required the authority of the federal government, the power and authority of the EPA, so that we identify first who the polluters were and that we will compel those polluters to pay for the cleanup of the canal. And that is happening, and it will happen. So every, every step of the way through this process, one of my priority has been ensuring that this is a community-driven process. That is why in 2002, we secured funding for a comprehensive community planning study for Gowanus through HOT, the Housing and Urban Development Agency. It was completed that comprehensive community feasibility study was completed four years later and led to the formation of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, one of tonight's hosts. It was through this inclusive process with much discussion and input from local residents and small businesses that we finally saw in 2010 the designation of the Gowanus Canal as a Superfund site in 2010. I remember getting calls and letters under the door of my house telling me that if I proceeded supporting the Gowanus Canal as a Superfund site, that we will pay the consequences because it will bring the real estate value around the Gowanus Canal down. Really? Really? So, one of the calls that I got was um, Mayor Bloomberg, and he asked me to please not come out supporting the designation of the Gowanus Canal. Back then, I said, Your Honor, with all due respect, I am not a scientist. I am an elected official. I will wait for the scientists to let me know what is the best way to 
clean up and restore the canal. So the rest is history. And I am so proud because not only it has been a community driven process, but EPA has been in the forefront of providing that process. One of the first actions taken by the EPA was to create or to form the Goanas Community Advisory Group, which has been meeting monthly for so many years now. One of the largest in the country, the CAG has been an important role following every step of the process, facilitating local dialogue and shaping the cleanup process. The cleanup plan for the Goanas includes removing contaminated sediment and capping dredged areas and is expected to cost $506 million. It will also generate economic activity. And so, I am telling you today, or tonight, that we expect for local businesses to be given the opportunity to participate in that process. <laughs> and so, starting in 2019, a lot of new jobs will be created. And so I have told EPA that I want for the EPA to create a Superfund Job Training Institute as they have done in New Jersey so that we could train able bodies that live in this area so that they could reap the benefits of the economic activity that is going to happen here. So I know that a lot of people were concerned when President Trump sent the budget to us. And so as we all know, President proposes, and that is his duty, but it is our privilege, the members of Congress, to dispose of the budget. Yes. And so yes. when they cut the Superfund program, by $360, $330 million, we restore the funding. So for 2017, the funding for the Superfund is $1.08 billion, and we are on track this year to approve a similar amount, or maybe slightly higher. So no one should be concerned that the Superfund program will not have the money to continue the work that we are doing here. That is what our community deserves. So, in closing, let me say this. We are cleaning up the canal the right way, in a manner respectful of community needs. When you look at other sites around the country, we are on an ambitious timeline for cleanup. It's going to take in other parts of the country much, much longer because of the work that the Army Corps of Engineers did here that facilitated the kind of data that they needed and put the whole work that needed to happen here for about, what, five years? So I am proud of that. We have a long way to go, but today, today, the pilot dredging marks an important milestone, and I am proud we have come this far to implementing the cleanup design. The Gowanas is a high-profile Superfund site. Thanks to community engagement and focus by all of you, and we are seeing the results of that. So I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to the members of the CAG, but to everyone 
in this community. This is a tough community. And you know quite well that we deserve better and that we must always deserve better and that we must work collectively to provide the kind of feedback, the kind of input, that you do research, that you ask the tough question, and that is what you need to do. Hold elected officials accountable, hold agencies accountable, because we work for you. So thank you for being active participants throughout this process. So let's hear uh, from uh, the EPA uh, staff, the team that has been incredibly so um, productive, so respectful, so inclusive. Um, and I want to introduce the EPA regional direct administrator. Uh, he has 30 years of public service, uh, was a former is a former member of the State Assembly in upstate New York, uh, very uh, committed um, to the work that we are doing here. He has advocated uh, on uh, areas that have been impacted by hurricanes, such as upstate New York. He also not only provide, is the director for um, New York, New Jersey, but also Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I want to thank all of you also for your words and your deeds helping Puerto Rico. <laughs> for me, this is personal. All my family is in Puerto Rico. I was there just last Saturday. It is uh, heart-wrenching. Um, I went there the first time a day after the hurricane made landfall in my hometown of Yabucoa. I went there with Governor Cuomo. I went there a month later, and I feel like you haven't seen much change. But I just would like to remind everyone, and I know that here in New York, I don't have to remind anyone. But these are American citizens. Yeah. These are our fellow citizens. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to have Pete Lopez come here. And I'm going to stay here until 7.45. But then I'm going to leave for a moment to go to Sunset Park. We have 10 containers of food and water that is leaving. And I want to be there with the community. Uh, so please um, excuse me, but I need to go there. But right now, let's bring uh, Pete and uh, welcome. And I hope that you will. I, I'm, look, EPA has been there with, for us, I promise you that I will have your back in Washington and that you will have the resources that you need. Gracias por todos. Um, mi familia es de Puerto Rico as well, también. So I, my father's from Camuy. Uh, sí. And so, so it may be mi familia. So, so, so cam, Camuy y ERC. So Boricuas, sí. So. So I, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you in community. And, and the Congresswoman is absolutely on the mark. Community is our strength. And, and as someone who served in the Assembly, and I have my colleague Joanne here as well, and we know we have others, other electeds from City Council, um, the best decisions, the best decision making starts with our homes and our families and our businesses. And I, I really welcome your engagement, and I'm so pleased to be here today with you. So I, I just want to say uh, the Congresswoman has been an exceptional champion for all of you, and, and I'm very proud of her to, to meet her. Uh, I know that she is committed to you. Um, and, and as someone uh, who served, my belief, and I see this with the Congresswoman, I look at service 
uh, really as, as almost like ripples in a pond. So you start with your immediate family, and then you, you work to your communities, your neighbors, and then you emanate. But to, to me, service is really an extension of family. And I see that with the Congresswoman, and I know she takes her job very seriously, and she's very committed. So I'm, I'm very thankful for her leadership and advocacy here, and it makes a difference. Um, so, so let's give her another hand. Sure, I will happy. So as you can tell, my, I'm a tenor, so my voice is not that big booming voice, but I'll, I'll keep the mic closer. So uh, the one thing I also want to comment on too is the, the strength of the community engagement, the, the CAGs who are here. And if we could have our CAG members please stand. I'd like to acknowledge your, your engagement, your service, your passion, your commitment. Please stand and let's give our CAG members a hand as well. Thank you. Thank you. So it, what I would like to do, and at some point, and I know tonight's really not the, the time, but I would like to join the CAG at one of your future meetings, and I'm very interested. Uh, we've been having conversation about what can we do to strengthen the community? How can we do better? And so we value your ideas, your insights, any suggestions on how we can strengthen the project. And again, we have a, a good team here working. Everyone's very committed, and we're very pleased to, to be part of that. Um, part of the program, the Superfund program, as you know, is really corner, cornerstone of what EPA does with its work. And uh, I'm very excited to be engaged with this, this particular project. Uh, very, very interested in projects that improve waterfront access, that improve quality of life. I think the, the Congresswoman spoke to making this a shining example. And I think through our, our collective efforts, with our resources, our commitment, that we can work in that direction. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so I don't want to be taking your whole evening. I know we want to get into an update on the program, but I do want to say to you that I have a very capable team. So I'm, I've only been in the job for four weeks. So in my first week, we were before Congress and working with a congresswoman advocating for Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. I was on the island myself, uh, and I can tell you that it was very sobering. And um, I was in my region, uh, Hurricane Irene and Lee, before Sandy devastated my region in the, in the northern Appalachia, uh, Schoharie County, Catskill Mountains. My parents were homeless, my sister was homeless, my communities were in states of emergency. And so when I was on the ground in Puerto Rico, the sights, the sounds, the smells were all too familiar. So, um, so much of my work uh, up to this point has been trying to focus on those communities and we're very much an emergency response. But, but the other part of the job is I have to be available and be focused on this community as well and the work that you're doing. So part of that team, and I'm just going to highlight quickly, um, so I, I just want to give some thanks to the professionals who've been working here. So Walter Mugden is our Superfund Division Director, and Walter, everyone knows Walter. So, uh, so I, I've nicknamed Walter our Renaissance man. So Walter is, is a man of many talents, but most what I value about Walter is his heart and Walter's compassion and his commitment. So I'm very pleased to have Walter as a friend and ally and a guide really in helping me understand your project more fully. Um, next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Christo Samis. Yeah. And Christo, yeah, I don't have to do anything. So, so I, for those who worked with him, we, we know that he is, he is um, he's hands-on and he is very dedicated and relentless in pursuit of, of making this a shining star for, for our community. Also, I'd like to, to make note uh, for Brian Carr. Where's Brian? Okay, so Brian is our, our attorney for the site and helping promote the, uh, the advancement. So, also, um, Natalie. So, Natalie. So, so what, uh, what makes me very happy is I don't have to say anything. I'll have to say their names and, and you know them and you understand their commitment and their engagement. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of EPA. We are committed to serving you. We are committed to resolving this. We want your communities to be safe. We, we want people to be, uh, have a quality of life. Um, there, there's an old vision, uh, an old statement that where there's no vision, the people perish. And what I see is tremendous vision in this room, tremendous energy, and we want to work towards that vision. So with that, I want to say thank you for letting me join you. And uh, I, as I, as I move uh, off the stage here, I want to introduce my colleague who sat not too far from me in the chamber, a very capable and talented member of the assembly, um, uh, Joanne Simon. So if I could have introduced Joanne, please join me.
So thank you. I, I want to say how very grateful I am uh, for a number of things. Uh, one is to have the the privilege of representing the people in this room and the community who has uh, come together and participated and engaged for so long uh, with the single goal of cleaning up the Gowanus Canal and improving people's lives. And so I just want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank um, our administrator, Peter Lopez. Is he gone already? Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, who really, you know, he's got a lot on his plate, as you might imagine. And uh, so I'm very grateful that you're here and participating and get to see this wonderful array of people who are there. You know, this is what it's all about. And I'm so happy that you're here and uh, uh, gonna be working with us closely. And of course, I wanna thank our Congresswoman, Nydia Velasquez, who is a bright and shining star in the firmament and who um, works incessantly for the people. And uh, so I wanna thank her from the bottom of my heart for all the work that she has done here. Um, so I just am here you know, my role tonight is really not to be speaking. It is just to welcome you, uh, to thank you for coming, for uh, committing the resources of my office to work with you. Um, I have a couple of my staff members here. My chief of staff, Susanna Pascantonio, is here. Hiding there she is. Uh, Rin Reed is here, who's new to the office. And uh, she'll be here the entire night. I have to go to something else in a little bit. But um, I wanted uh, all of you to, to know that we are here. We're happy to work with you, and um, it is by having everybody, sometimes we don't all agree, you know, uh, and that's okay, that's good, because we, by asking questions, by talking to each other, we all learn more and we all come up with better ideas and, and a more complete vision. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I was working up to my capacity, but you were <laughs> Okay, so um, I just wanted to, I don't know if I necessarily need the microphone. Um, so, I do? Okay. My loud voice isn't loud. Um, anyway, um, I th I'm looking out at, at a lot of faces, some I know, some that I don't, some that I probably will meet before the end of the evening. Um, and the purpose of this portion of the, of the evening's event is to kind of bring everybody up to speed on what this thing is called the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. And so I'm gonna take you um, through the story of the Gowanus Canal, how, it's, how, it for, how it was formed, how it became a Superfund site, and what the cleanup of the canal is gonna be looking like. No music. <laughs> So this actually is a diagram that represents the Superfund process. You know, Superfund sites is a whole path that it has to go through from the beginning with the site assessment and, um, um, I'm sorry, the preliminary assessment and, and the site investigation through the listing and all of that. So um, this is the path that we're going to be going along over the course of this evening. So, Let's look at what here, what this area looked like in the, in the 1700s. That's how old this canal is. It actually predates that. But in, in New Amsterdam, while the, when the, the original 13 colonies, where we are, this is what Brooklyn used to look like. Um, and the Gowanus Canal exists, at that time it was Gowanus Creek, and this is what Gowanus Creek originally looked like. There were marshes around there, there were lakes, and um, you could well imagine that Brooklyn in the 1700s is not like Brooklyn in the 2017. Um, what happened was there were many mills, there were lakes and, and, and mills in the area, and when the Erie Canal was built, those grain mills no longer were, oper were no longer necessary um, for transportation of goods, and, and this, that red line, well, that is the outline of the original Gowanus Canal. So you can see that areas where there were ponds and marshes, those were filled in, and this man-made canal was created. So it went from Gowanus Creek as a natural water body to Gowanus Canal, and this is what it looks like today. Um, so very early on in the, 
the start of the building of the canal. This is, what, this is what Brooklyn looked like when the canal was first being built. And very soon after it was completed in the 1860s, um, there was, the, the canal became one of the most well-traveled water bodies in the country. Barges came, plied up and down the canal bringing goods into the area. As a matter of fact, much of brownstone Brooklyn can be traced to the Gowanus Canal. Marble, brick, wood, coal, all of that came along this water body. And very quickly, um, we have here, this is a, this is a manufactured gas plant. This is Citizens. This is where a public place is at the bend of the canal. That picture was taken in about the 1920s. And this, this uh, manufactured gas plant, basically it would take coal, heat it up, and the gas that, was, that came off of the coal processing, that's what people used to light their homes. And so living close to this area made it, was, was very convenient and people had lighting. And, um, but a byproduct of that coal processing is coal tar. And we're going to be talking a lot about that over the course of the evening. Well, very soon after the canal was built, it was declared a nuisance by the Board of Health. Why? Because the canal, as you know, on Butler Street, the canal, there's a dead end. There was no natural flushing of the canal, so water would come in. And you can imagine in, those, in that, that time in this country, there was no such thing as environmental protection. So anything, garbage, filth, anything was thrown into the canal. And it was, so what New York City decided to do and this image should be familiar to many of you. Oops, maybe not that one. Um, this is a sewer outfall that's at the head of the canal. So because that water body was a dead end, um, this, sewer, these, this sewer outfall was built to help to flush the canal. So sewage ended up going into the canal to help, to help run the water out through it. Unfortunately, as you could well imagine, that wasn't necessarily the most effective way. And so what ended up happening is that New York City built something called the Flushing Tunnel. And it brought, it brought water from Buttermilk Channel on a tunnel underground, and it ended up at the head of the canal to bring fresh water in. And, and I'm sure many of you have noticed the Flushing Tunnel is now operational, and water comes, is rushing back into the head of the canal. So, from the early, so as I said, very early on in its history, the Gowanus Canal was a, became a contaminated water body. Let's go back to that path that we were talking about. So um, when the canal was brought to the EPA's attention, we did something um, first called the Preliminary Assessment and Site Investigation. We looked at this water body, we looked at the canal to see, well, what kind of contamination is there? Does it pose a, a risk? And soon after that, we determined that yes, in fact, the Gowanus Canal did qualify to be placed on the Superfund site list. And the Gowanus Canal in 2010, thank you, um, was placed on the Superfund site list and it became, instead of just the Gowanus Canal, it became the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. That meant it was now um, eligible for Superfund funding to clean it up if there were no PRPs. That means the people responsible for the contamination. But in the case of the Gowanus Canal, the responsible parties have been identified and they will be funding the cleanup of the canal. So once the site was listed, we went into the next step called the Remedial Investigation and Feasibility Study. Basically, we look at the nature and extent of contamination, and look at feasible options for cleaning it up. So part of that remedial investigation feasibility study looked at the historic contamination at the site. You can see in this image, in the background, there is one of those large tanks that, remember I spoke about the, the manufactured gas plants? For some, for some of you who are of a certain age, like myself, I remember seeing these tanks on the skyline of Brooklyn many years ago. Um, for the younger folk, I know this is completely foreign. But anyway, um, this, we looked at some of the, oops, excuse me, I'm sorry, there we go. 
Um, we looked at some of the sources of contamination. We looked at tanneries, coal yards, the manufactured gas plants. As I said, once the canal was built, there were many, many industries that cropped up alongside the canal. And most of those, a great majority of them, may have contributed contamination not only to the water but to the sediment at the bottom of the canal. So we looked at those historic um, facilities that contributed contamination to the canal. The, this image sh shows the three original manufactured gas plants that once dotted the banks of the canal. Those are those coal gasification plants that converted coal to gas, and a byproduct of it was coal tar. Um, this location at the northern end of the canal, uh, many of you might be familiar with it. This is where this is what it used to look like on Douglas Street. It may not look familiar, you may remember it, you may recognize it as that. That's the Thomas Green Park. Thomas Green Park is built on top of a former manufactured gas plant. And so underneath the pool area of Thomas Green Park, there is substantial coal tar, the remnants of that former coal gasification plant. Um, the other, one of the other sources, major sources of contamination to the, into the canal. Remember that image I showed you of the, of the CSO, the combined sewer outfall? New York City has a combined sewer system. That means that the sanitary waste that comes out of your home goes into the sewers and it, it gets sent off to a, a water treatment facility. It also means that when it rains, the street runoff also goes into that sewer line. However, when it rains, the water treatment plants cannot, cannot sustain that increased volume of water. And so a portion of it ends up being shuttled, dumped into um, a water body. And the Gowanus Canal receives um, diluted sewage over uh, during heavy rainstorms. That diluted sewage also contains whatever contamination may be on the streets. And so this also has, this also, uh, along with the facilities that used to operate along the canal and the manufactured gas plants, this sewage also contains hazardous materials and it is also contributing con contamination to the canal. And so let's look at, a, this is kind of a, a schematic of what contamination looks like at the canal. So remember, this used to be a natural water body. So right at the bottom here, that's the native original sediment of the Gowanus. On top of it is deposits of all sorts of hazardous material, including polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, PCBs, heavy metals and non-aqueous phase liquids. So there is sediment at the bottom of the canal that, is, that contains high levels of contamination. The contamination is so extensive in certain parts of the canal that it has also migrated down into the original native sediment. So if we scraped off all of the sediment from the bottom of the canal, there are still areas where the contamination is so extensive that the original bottom of the canal is also contaminated. So this, this sediment can be anywhere from about 10 to 20 feet thick um, sometimes even, it averages about 10, about 10 feet. Um, however, that's over the entire surface of the canal. However, that contamination in the native sediment goes several feet down, 20, 30, 40. Thank you. Thank you. 100 feet in certain areas. So look, here is, a, here is a photograph of that outfall at the northern end of the canal. And you can see this mound of sedimentation, so stuff that comes out of the sewer. Um, that, that material, um, the, those contaminated material, the, the, the contaminated chem, sorry, the chemicals adhere to the surface of it. So this stuff is, um, is some of the things that we were talking about, that sediment. And during that remedial investigation, we, were actually, we actually took samples of it, analyzed it, and determined that there were 
highly toxic. So um, I think we've used that phrase, black mayonnaise, um, and this is a photograph of an actual core sample that was taken during the remedial investigation and feasibility study. Um, so one of the things we also look at is exposure pathways. Are there, are there ways that people may be, become um, exposed to contamination from the canal? Remember, this area was um, marshland. So any time it rains, as people who live in this community know, flooding is not uncommon. So there's flooding. Some people do recreational boating on the canal. Um, there was an individual, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he actually swam in the Gowanus Canal. I remember, as an aside, I remember having a conversation with him suggesting that that, not, that might not be the best way to spend his time. He did say that the water tasted like um, baby diapers and gasoline, which, which then begins to beg the question, you actually tasted the water from the Gowanus Canal? But, um, and then and, and subsistence fishing. So there, there are pathways for people to become in, to come in contact with contamination from the canal. Um, boating is not necessarily a way to get in contact with the, um, the highly toxic material, um, but we want to make sure that people understand that these are ways that people can come in contact with the canal itself. So, We've already determined during the preliminary assessment and site investigation that it should be placed on the Superfund site list. The canal was placed on the list. We did our remedial investigation and feasibility study and looked at sources of contamination at the canal and possible ways for us to address that. Um, we came out with a document called a proposed plan, which laid out what EPA's approach would be to cleaning up the canal. And that document um, was, was approved in something we called a record of decision. I'm going to turn the mic over to Walter Mugden, who's going to lay out what the record of decision included and where we're moving on from there. We'll see if I screw up the computer here a lot. So, um, we're now going to talk a little bit about the cleanup of the canal itself under the Superfund program. I got it. it all right, well, yeah, you'll do a better job than I do. <laughs> so, so, as Natalie said, we have this document called a Record of Decision. We speak in acronyms, so it's ROD or ROD. And we issued that in 2013. And this is the big complicated document in which we say, here is how we have chosen to do the cleanup after having a lot of public input from the proposed plan to the time of the record of decision. And these are the steps in summary that the record of decision has called for. First thing is we're gonna dredge the soft sediments. So Natalie spoke about this black mayonnaise which is like 10 or 12 feet deep, or even deeper in some spots. It's heavily contaminated. In most Superfund sites, we measure contamination in parts per million, or parts per billion, or even parts per trillion. Here at the bottom of this 10 or 12 feet of sediment, outside some of those manufactured gas plant locations, we can measure coal tar, products in parts per hundred, three, four and a half percent of coal tar in the bottom of that stuff. So all of that has to come out. And it's going to be disposed of off-site. We're not going to dispose of it anywhere in this particular area or this community. It's going to go to permitted disposal facilities away. We're also going to then have to, however, as, as Natalie indicated, even when we dig out those 10 or 12 or 14 feet of black mayonnaise, of soft, gooey, heavily contaminated mud, even the native sediments at the bottom of that, the sandy area, are still contaminated. And in some places, the contamination goes down very, very deep. So we got to do something to prevent that contamination from continuing to get into the ecosystem, to get into the fish, to get into the crabs, to get into the, ultimately, the people. So we have to put a cap down. 
And I'll show you a little later what a cap looks like. It's a series of layers of different material, the purpose of which is to isolate the contaminated area from where the critters live. In some spots, even that is not enough. And in some spots, the coal tar contamination is so intense that we have to go yet another step further. And what we have to do there is something we call in situ stabilization. What that means basically is that we put big augers or drills down into the sand below the mud and we mix concrete into, or cement I should say, we mix cement or something very much like cement into the sand and it hardens just like the cement does here that, that you use to build a building. It hardens up and it'll actually become a hard layer that will create an additional barrier a really strong barrier to the upward migration of that coal tar that goes 10, 20, 40, 100 feet deep. And that'll be done in certain areas of the canal where the coal tar is most intense. Now, these old manufactured gas plant sites that Natalie told you about, about there's three of them. The first one is down where the Lowe's is right now. The second one is the Citizens, that's where Public Place is right now. The third one called Fulton is where the Double D Park is, the Thomas Green Park is right now. Those locations on land still have a lot of coal tar underneath them. And that coal tar continues to migrate out into the canal and under the canal. And so we got to stop that too or reduce that as much as possible. So these old former manufactured gas plant sites also have to be cleaned up on the land portion. And the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, and we've got folks here from the DEC today, they're in charge of that part of the cleanup. Then, Natalie spoke about these combined sewer overflows, where every time it rains, you get a combination of raw sewage plus rainwater coming right out into the canal. And we don't want after we spend hundreds of millions of dollars cleaning up the canal, we don't want it to get dirty again. And although what comes out of the CSOs in terms of chemical pollution is at a much lower level, a much lower concentration than the coal tar and other stuff that came out in the past, there's still enough of it so that it'll recontaminate the canal if we don't deal with it. So our record of decision also requires that big tanks be built, two of them, in the upper reaches of the canal, which will collect the excess rainwater and sewage when it rains heavily. One of those tanks will be 8 million gallons. That one will be right up at the head of the canal. And we'll have some pictures showing you where it's going to be. And the other one will be 4 million gallons. That'll be a little bit further down, just below where the bend of the canal is, where, where kind of where the Whole Foods is, uh, below that, below where Whole Foods is. When it rains, and the rain and the sewage exceeds the capacity of the pipes to carry it to the sewage treatment plant, then the first 8 million gallons or 4 million gallons, depending on which tank we're talking about, of excess rainwater and sewage will go into those tanks. And that'll be the worst, the dirtiest part of the stuff. It's what's called the first flush. Guess why? So that'll go into the tank. If the rain is still very heavy, then the excess will still go into the canal, but now the excess is going to be much, much cleaner. Once the rain stops, the, the bad stuff in those tanks gets pumped back into the sewage system and gets pumped to the sewage treatment plants so it can be cleaned up. So those, t those two storage tanks are a really key element of the cleanup program. Finally, you know that when uh, Natalie showed you the map of the canal, you saw these horizontal lines going off to the sides of the canal. Those were called turning basins. And when the barges came in, they would sort of turn into the turning basin and then they could back back out so that they could turn around and go back out. So these, there were a number of these turning basins. One of them, some of them have gotten partially filled in. The first street turning basin had gotten completely filled in at some time in the past. The stuff that they filled it in with was also contaminated. So part of our record of decision is dig it back out. 
Not only will that get rid of contamination, but it will also create another area of open water. And that's one of the things that we want to really promote. Okay. So again, uh, this is a, the same map that you've seen earlier for planning purposes and construction purposes. Uh, Christos, who is your project manager, has divided the canal into three or actually four segments. Uh, they're called RTA. I know it stands for something, but I can't remember what it stands for. Oh, remediation target areas. It's, it's right up there. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. RTA number one comes right down to just above the 4th Street Turning Basin. That's where the Whole Foods is. That's the first segment, and it's going to be dealt with first. RTA number two comes all the way down to, I guess that's the Gowanus Expressway. RTA three is divided into 3A and 3B. It's what all goes out into the harbor. The area here, 3A, is re still relatively shallow the way the rest of the canal is. When you get out into 3B, it's uh, much deeper there. So those three areas are going to be dealt with sequentially. So we're going to start the work in RTA 1 and then move our way down. And what we learn as we go, what, what lessons we learn about R in RTA 1 will be able to be applied to RTA 2 and 3. And I want to stress that there's going to be a lot of lessons learned here. This is an unbelievably complicated project. It's complicated for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and among those reasons is the fact that the canal is very narrow. You've got a series of low bridges that cross it. For the equipment that has to do all this work to move back and forth, it's very complicated. But there's lots of other problems. The bulkheads on the sides of the canal that keep the land from falling into the water, those bulkheads in many cases are very old. Sometimes they're old things made out of wood. Even when they're a little newer, they don't go down very deep. And we're going to have to put new bulkheads almost throughout the entire canal. And those new bulkheads are going to have to be much deeper so that when the mud gets dug out, then we really don't want the land to fall in. So another part of the whole remedy is going to be replacing bulkheads. And a lot of that work is already going on. Pretty much any time somebody's redeveloping a portion of the canal in the last couple of years, they're working with us. Christos is giving them design specifications for how they should build the bulkhead next to their property, like, for example, the Lightstone property. And those bulkheads that have been going in for those redevelopment sites already meet the specifications that we need for the Superfund cleanup. Next uh, slides. So we talked earlier about the idea that you put a cap down over the old native contaminated sediment because it's still contaminated and you want to make sure that the contamination doesn't get to where the critters live. The little animals that live in the mud, the crabs and eventually the fish and the birds that eat the fish and the people that eat the fish. And if anybody questions whether the people eat the fish, here's an anecdote. When Christos was doing the study that led to this cleanup plan, he went down to where the fishing pier is out at the head of the canal, and uh, he saw a couple of guys there, and they had some pails with them, and they were fishing. And they had about 10 fish in the two pails. And he went up and he said, so it's a good fishing day. I, what do you do with these fish? Do you take them home and eat them? And the guy said, sure. But when we have a really good day like this, we sell the excess to the restaurants. <laughs> so yes, people are eating the fish. And the fish carry the contamination, and they carry them into the people. So one of the reasons that we want to clean this canal up is so that there comes a time when people can do that and can do it safely. So a cap is important. We have down here the, the native sediment, the sandy stuff that was at the bottom originally before, uh, before any development took place. It's still contaminated. On top of that, in those special areas where the coal tar is really intense, we're going to do this stabilization. That's where we're going to mix the concrete or the cement into the sand and turn it into essentially a big slab of concrete to prevent the coal tar from coming up through that. Above that, there'll be what we call a treatment layer. This is a layer of specialized material that actually, if contamination gets through and gets into that treatment layer, the treatment layer actually captures it and prevents it from getting up further. Above that, there's what we call the sand and gravel isolation layer. It's made out of sand and gravel, and its purpose is to isolate anything that lives above it, 
from the bad stuff below it. Above that, we have a layer of gravel, which is called an armor layer. We don't want, if there's, a, if there's a heavy, heavy rainstorm and the water is really moving fast, or if you have boats going through it and the propellers are spinning and turning and, and it's low tide and it's creating prop wash, we don't want this sand, and gra sand layer here, we don't want that to be disturbed. So the armored layer on top of that armors it. It prevents damage to the lower layers. And at the very top, we put in another layer of soil-like material, which is the habitat layer, and that's what's going to be conducive to the little animals that live there at the bottom of the food chain, because we want the food chain to come back, the crabs and the fish. Okay? <clears throat> now, we're going back to this uh, pathway here, and previously we had the record of decision, and I just walked you through that, what it contains. Now I'm going to tell you where we are today. So the next step in the pathway is written here as RDRA, which stands for Remedial Design and Remedial Action. So a remediation like this is extremely complicated, and it needs to be designed, and it needs to be designed very, very carefully. We're talking about all these bulkheads, we're talking about these entire, all the dredging, the capping, the stabilization work that has to be done. We've got to manage the dredge muck when it comes up. It's got to get the water either squeezed out of it or settling out of it. The water has to be treated to get clean. The muck that's then left over has to be carefully packaged and, and shipped to wherever it's going to go. Those CSO tanks, the, the retention tanks for the combined sewer overflows, they have to be designed. It's incredibly complicated. So we're in the remedial design phase right now. And these are the next steps that are coming. So the first thing I want to mention, Natalie mentioned PRPs. That stands for Potentially Responsible Parties. Under the Superfund law, there's a whole series of, of people, or types of people, who are responsible for the costs of cleanup. And among those are the people who created the mess in the first place. So you see here the name National Grid. I suppose many of you know National Grid. It's probably your, your gas company here, right? Well, National Grid never did any of this stuff, but here's what happened. Those manufactured gas plants that Natalie talked about, there were three of them. They were among 20 or 25 in Brooklyn. And in the early 1900s, all of those companies were all combined into a single company called Brooklyn Union Gas, Bug. Anybody here old enough to remember Bug, right? Yeah, OK. Uh, so, Bug ran those plants until they were closed, and then in the early 1990s, Bug was sold to a company called Keyspan, and in the early 2000s, Keyspan was sold to National Grid. So National Grid is like 80, 90 years away from any of these manufactured gas plants operating, but under the law, National Grid owns the legal liability, going all the way back through Keyspan, back to Bug, back to those individual manufactured gas plants. So National Grid is one of about 30 or 40 responsible parties, but they're one of the leading ones, and they have actually stepped up, and they've agreed to carry out the design for the canal remedy. And so they're doing that right now, along with contributions from the other 20 or 30 responsible parties. Part of the design work there are several pilot projects that are being carried out as part of the design to inform the design. So one of them was actually something that EPA did, I think two years ago, is that right, Christos? 2015. 2015. We did a, in the 7th Street Turning Basin, Christos actually carried out an in situ stabilization pilot project. I told you how this, you put the auger down through the mud, you get it down into the native sand, you add cement, and you try and harden it up. We wanted to see whether that really worked the way we thought it would. And so that project was carried out in the turning basin, and it worked exactly as designed. So that's part of the overall design, but in fact, that work has already now been done in the 7th Street turning basin. Next. Another one is we had to see how difficult it was going to be to, to get the, the, the debris out of the canal, because to do the cleanup, to do all this dredging, you got to get all that crud that's in there. You got cars, you got bicycles, you got uh, 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 shopping carts, possibly Jimmy Hoffa, we don't know. Um, so 
we had to do a pilot project to demonstrate how you identify where the debris is and how you get it out and how you deal with it once you get it out in a safe way. And so that was done, and that was done in the 4th Street Turning Basin, is that right, Christos? So that's right next to the Whole Foods there. And that was done in 2016. And then the next one uh, is the, turning, the 4th Street Turning Basin dredging pilot. So that's the same 4th Street Turning Basin. It's that little arm of the canal right next to Whole Foods. And here, National Grid, under our direction, is doing a pilot project to actually do the dredging and capping in that segment. And it's a complicated thing. The first thing they got to do is put in the new bulkheads so that those bulkheads go down deep far enough and can hold up the canal when it's being dredged. Then they're going to actually do the dredging and then they're going to do the capping and they're going to learn along the way what all could go wrong. And lots of things can go wrong. So the whole point of these pilot projects is to learn so that when they get into the actual real main part of the canal, they already have uh, a lot of more information. So that work that's going on right now that some of you may have actually gone and seen it. In fact, they started in October. They had to do a little bit of dredging just so they could get their equipment into the turning basin because it was so shallow. And then they're now starting to work on putting the bulkheads in. We had hoped and expected that that work would be done by December and that they would actually start the dredging part of the project in December, but guess what? We ran into some unexpected difficulties. We're learning a lot from those. It looks now like the dredging work will probably start in, in January. Is that right, Christos? So a little bit of a delay, but again, the purpose of the pilot project is to learn. And that is what's, and you learn more from problems than you learn from no problems. So that's what's going on right now. All right, um, the next thing that's happening is that National Grid is also going to be removing the coal tar from underneath the portion of the, of the Thomas Green Park. Remember that uh, when, when Natalie showed the picture of where the old Fulton manufactured gas plant factory was, and then she showed the picture of Thomas Green Park, you saw where the swimming pool is and where the handball courts are on the western end of that, of that block of where the park is. Well, there's a lot of coal tar underneath that. And we need that coal tar to be removed so that it doesn't continue to get into the canal and, again, make the canal dirty after we get it clean. So National Grid is obliged to remove the contamination from the Thomas Green Park and also from some other properties that are closer to the canal, sort of between the park and the canal. Now, that's going to require that the pool get removed. You can't dig it out. You can't dig out the stuff under the pool without removing the pool. But we're not going to allow that to happen until a temporary replacement pool is built that will... And that... So nothing will happen on the park until the temporary pool is up and operating. And that temporary pool will continue to operate until the new one is ready to go. So National Grid has to do one more thing. As I said, up at that old Fulton manufactured gas plant site, near where the head of the canal is and near where the park is, there's a lot of coal tar still underneath the, underneath the ground. And we don't want that to get into the canal. Once we spend a half a billion dollars cleaning up the canal, we don't want it to get dirty again. So in addition to digging out the mother load underneath the pool and nearby, they're also going to put in what we call a cutoff wall. So this is the same thing as like a bulkhead, but it's much stronger and it goes way deeper. How, how deep is the cutoff wall, Christos? 50 feet? Yeah. So the cutoff wall is going to go all the way underground 50 feet. And the pieces of pilings, as they get driven in, lock together. And a sealant is put into that joint where, the, where each piling meets the next one. So it becomes a really solid barrier to the movement of any remaining coal tar from the land into the canal. And so it's going to extend from the head of the canal up there down to, what is this, the third street? Uh, this is Union Street Bridge. I'm sorry, Union Street Bridge. So it's going to be all along the way there. And uh, so Ma uh, National Grid is right now designing that, and then they're going to install it after they finish the design. New York City, which runs the sewage system, New York City is designing, meanwhile, the combined sewer overflow storage tanks that we've talked about. The 8 million gallon tank, 
and the four million gallon tank. And uh, here's where they're gonna go. And as those of you who've been involved in this project for some time know, this was pretty controversial. When we wrote the record of a decision at EPA, we said to ourselves, hypothetically, where might the eight million gallon tank go? And we said, well, this part of Thomas Green Park has to be dug out anyhow, because it's got coal tar underneath it, like I just said. So we figured, well, why don't you dig it out and put the tank in there when you got the hole open? Um, but the city of New York had uh, reasons, and quite strong reasons, why they didn't want to do that. And quite a number of members of the community also said, you know, it's one thing to lose our pool for whatever it is, two or three years, maybe four years, but to lose it for eight or ten years is no good. So the city ultimately decided that it was going to build its tank in these parcels right here that are immediately adjacent to the canal. That does require, those are privately owned properties, it requires that the city either offer the property owners enough money to allow them to sell it voluntarily, or if not, the city has the power to and will is prepared to take those properties by eminent domain. Uh, so that is the press, that is what's underway right now. Because there is some remaining questions about how quickly all of this can be done, the city is actually doing, by agreement with us, two designs at the same time. They're designing the tanks in the location where they intend to put them, the tank, I should say, singular, the one, the eight million gallon tank. And at the same time, they're designing a tank that could go here if necessary. Again, that's not the intention. And right now the city is on schedule and on target to do what it needs to do to acquire these properties. But as you all know, it's been controversial. And we wanted to have, again, a little bit of assurance that we wouldn't lose four, five, six years if that process suddenly collapsed for one reason or another. So we asked the city and the city said, yes, they'll design both possible locations at the same time. Let's go to the next one. I told you there's two tanks, and the other tank, the smaller one, the four million gallon tank, is right down here. Again, this is the 4th Street Turning Basin. There's the Whole Foods. There's the Whole Foods parking lot with the nice solar panels above where you park your car. And on this triangular piece of property, which the city already owns, that's where the four million gallon tank is going to go. And uh, so that's uh, what's happening on that element of the cleanup. We ex so far, the responsible parties have been doing all of this design work. And they've been paying for it. Uh, we do the oversight. We explain what has to be done. We make sure it's being done to our satisfaction. But they're doing it, and they are actually paying for it. And we expect that the same will happen when it comes time to now actually build the remedy. Right now, it's all in design. Yes, there's work going on. Like at the 4th Street Turning Basin, you come in January, you're going to actually see the actual remediation work going on. But it's going on as part of the design. Once the design is done, and that's currently, we're looking at around 20, uh, 2019 to have the design finished, at that point, we expect and we intend that the responsible parties will then move into the next phase, which is to actually do the cleanup work. So we hope that by 2020, or we expect and intend that by 2020, uh, the work in RTA1, and you remember that's that first segment of the canal uh, that runs from the head of the canal down to about where the Whole Foods is, we expect that work to start in around 2020. There was a time when people said, hey, how long is the whole thing going to take? And at one point, we had been able to say, well, we think we might be able to be done by 2022. That's not going to happen. It's going to be a little longer. Uh, but in the various segments, uh, we might get RTA 1 done pretty close to that period of time. To get all the way down to the lower part of the canal is going to take a little longer. Uh, many years ago, somebody asked me about how long this was all going to take. I said, well, I thought 10 years. And I then said, that's what we call a planning schedule. A planning schedule says if everything went smoothly, and everything happened in a perfectly good way from one step to the next, we think we could do this in 10 years. Well, that's not how the world actually works. But on the other hand, if we had planned, so we planned for 10 years, maybe it'll take 12 or 14. If we had planned for 12 or 14, it would have taken 16 or 18. And if we had planned for 16 or 18, it would take 20 or 22. So the purpose of a planning schedule is to be ambitious and aggressive 
and then deal with problems as they arise. Problems will continue to arise. But we've got a top-notch team working on it, and they're going to be making sure that those problems are dealt with as we go. So that's where we are right now. Is that our last slide? Or no, you got one more. OK. Let me give it back to Natalie here. Um, thank you. Um, I, I want to I wanna turn the mic over um, to a Councilman Brad Lander. He's, he's uh, attending, and he, I'm sure he has a couple of um, inspirational words for us all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, Walter, what I remember you saying when asked how long it was going to take is, longer than you want, shorter than you fear. That's what I remember you saying. And I want to say you've done a really good job at uh, pushing forward and delivering. I mean, of course, there's been some slippage in the timeline. But to have this big a process organized by a federal agency with this many other agencies involved, moving along in the time frame that it is, continuing forward despite the national politics, is, is we're grateful. So I just want to say thank you to you guys, to Christos, to Walter, uh, to Natalie, to the EPA. Like, it's. It, it, it should be, this is what you should be able to expect from your government at city, state, and federal levels. It is often not what we are able to expect from our government. And I mean, you know, when we have a clean canal, then we'll really be able to say thank you. But the, the process and the progress so far have been significant, and I, I'm really grateful for it. Um, you want to ask questions, understand more of the issues. I know that you had, you know, there's obviously been dialogue with DEP about the tanks, lots of other issues. We've, of course, had more hours about the planning issues through the Gowanus Places study than I think any other place that's ever been planned on the planet. Uh, we're not going to go into those issues now. Um, I uh, am glad so many people are here, are sticking with this process, and are really doing this perfect mix of, like, pushing hard and holding accountable, uh, organizing, uh, but staying involved uh, and engaging. Um, and it's making a big difference. So thank you guys all for being here. Thank you for coming out tonight and for all the work that it reflects. We'll stick in it together for just as long as it takes. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, I just want to do one quick thing. Um, many of you, this is the first time that you've come to um, one of these presentations. Um, and I just wanted to just give you a little bit of a takeaway. Um, there was a lot of information that we shared um, today. And I know it's, it's kind of hard to g wrap your mind around all of it. There are places where you can go um, to get more information. Um, EPA does have a Gowanus um, web page. You can do a search on Google for Gowanus Canal Superfund site, where you can get a lot of the site-related information. Um, it has a document called the Community Involvement Plan that kind of covers all of what we spoke about. Um, the Gowanus Canal Superfund site is one of the only uh, Superfund sites in the country with its own Facebook page. I'm the administrator of, thank you, another one of my titles. Um, the, the Gowanus Canal Community Advisory Group, 55 members strong, they have their own web page, and the Gowanus Canal Group meets every to every month, not every Tuesday, every fourth Tuesday of, of every month. And if you go on their webpage, you can um, see the schedule. So there are opportunities, not only for tonight, but moving forward, where you can get more information about the site and you can become more involved. So we're going to open up the floor for a question and answer. Um, and, and I see, oh, people, people have written down questions? I'm, I'm going to pass on to my, um, my CAG member. Good evening. Uh, because we respect your time and your concerns and your question, we decided to do a format where everybody will go who has a question or a concern. We go to the, make a line like that. Nobody feels neglected, that nobody's looking and you know, raising your hands. And then you go to the speaker and you make the question. And we suggest that you make it quick so like that many people have the opportunity to do it like you. And you're going to be recording, you're going to be watch and be capping all the television networks. Thank you. Thank you. Is this the line? Is this the line? 
Oh, I see. Um, one of the instructions that I was given is that if you've gotten a question card, you can write your question on the card. So if it isn't answered tonight, it'll be collected and your questions will be answered at a later date. Um, so where Raphael is, that is the uh, microphone. Um, if you'd like to ask your questions, we'd ask that you line up over there, please. So um, I'm pleased to hear the uh, gentleman earlier tonight from the EPA talk about safety. Currently, the Fourth Street Basin has one bulkhead that is unsafe because if you were to fall in the Gowanus, you cannot exit safely. Uh, can you walk us through what your plans for uh, the work currently underway at the Fourth Street Basin? What kind of safe access will be included in your bulkhead design so that should you fall into the water, you can safely exit the waterway onto, say, Dyke's Lumber property or something like that. Thank you. So I think I understand the question, but uh, and, and I imagine what you're speaking about is the area of the next to Whole Foods where there's rocks, the riprap. We're just, I'm just talking about your new project and yeah. what you're doing with your waterfront so edge because the current the waterfront edge. The short is answer not. is the bulkheads are going to be vertical, as bulkheads typically are, and. If somebody falls into the water, I am afraid to say it's not going to be easy to get out. So this is not a waterway that people should be doing anything near that could allow them to fall into the water. You saw a photograph that Natalie had of people canoeing, and a lot of people canoe and kayak on the canal, and that's great. And people have asked many times in the past, is it safe? And our answer has always been the same. It's don't fall in. Don't tip. Uh, this is not water that you wish to be in. If for some reason you do get into the water and when you get out, then immediately you need to wash off very thoroughly. That's the important element here. And of course, self-evidently, do not try to swallow anything when you're, when you're in the water. But this is not water that at this stage of the game is, is good to be contacting. And certainly not the mud. The water is less contaminated the mud. The mud is more heavily contaminated. I understand your point, and the fact of the matter is that when you have a, a, an artificial waterway like this, as is fact true of much of New York's waterways, they are hard edges. They're not soft edges the way they were in nature. They're hard edges with a vertical bulkhead. And that means that if you fall into the water, it is difficult to get out, and we understand that. Yes, without a ladder or without some other device of that sort, yes. sir. Hello, my name's Andy, and you would know best which person can answer this, but the question is, uh, which of these remedial steps will last for how many years? For example, you said something in passing about 10 years for the uh, CSO tanks, um, and the Green Park disruption would be less time. Uh, the stabilized cap is supposedly permanent, but is it designed to last 30 years or 100 or what? The stabilized, so let me start with the la tail end of that. The stabilized cap is designed to last, what, over a century, right? 100 years. And in fact, it will probably last longer, but that's the design sort of specification. The, uh, the actual sequence of, so there's many different moving parts here, and they have to interact. Uh, the, there's a detailed schedule that, that changes from time to time as we learn more. But the steps along the way, the first thing that's going to happen is that that cutoff wall is going to go in. And then after the cutoff wall goes in, probably the next thing that you'll be seeing will be work. Shortly thereafter, you'll probably see work start maybe in the 2021, 2020 period in RTA1, in the canal itself. Uh, Around me, the same I, period. Excuse me, I wasn't really talking about the schedule for doing the job. I was talking about the life expectancy. Oh, the life expectancy. So again, that, that in situ stabilization should last at least 100 years, perhaps longer. Uh, the, uh, the tanks, again, should last as long as infrastructure of that sort can last. I mean, I don't know exactly whether it's 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years, but uh, it's built very, very robustly, and it's part of the city's infrastructure, which will have to be maintained in order to keep it going. So it's permanent. Yeah. So it is permanent, yes. It is permanent. Uh, were there other elements of that question, or did that more or less hit it? Um, and if you want more details, you can maybe yeah. meet with us afterwards, and we can provide some more information. You already said that the disruption of the Green Park would be temporary. The disruption of the, of the Thomas Green Park will only be for so long as is necessary for the, the pool to be removed, the handball courts to be removed, 
the soil underneath it that's contaminated to be dug out down to a depth of about 20, 25 feet, then for the to be backfilled and for the new pool to be built. And by the way, I'll say the following. National Grid, which is responsible for the coal tar for the reasons I told you earlier, they're the ones who are now obliged to remove the pool, put in a temporary pool, dig out underneath the pool, get rid of the soil, clean it up, put it away, put new soil in, and their obligation then is to provide the city with a replacement of the same kind of what was there. The city parks department has already pretty much hinted or said they're going to use this opportunity to build a better pool and park facility. Uh, so they will probably have to add some additional money of their own to that which National Grid is providing, but it would be silly not to take that wonderful opportunity to now improve the facilities that are there for the community. So I, I believe that that's going to happen. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, Walter. I'm Sal Talivia. Uh My first question is the Superfund site. That's basically to clean the canal. It is to clean the canal and and I know where you're going with this because you and I spoke earlier and we've spoken a couple of times before and Sal owns one of those pieces of property that I mentioned earlier in the photograph where the city has decided it's going to build the sewage, the, the, the tank. So uh, the, the question is what is the definition of a Superfund site because that has legal ramifications, some of which are very unfortunate for him. The answer is under the law, the Superfund site is wherever the contamination is. So it's a very fluid or a very elastic definition. It allows us to make sure that we're not bureaucratically hamstrung. And our view is that cleaning up the canal and not looking at the contamination that remains on land and continues to come in from the land or remains in the sewer system and continues to come in from the sewer system, that would be penny wise and pound foolish. So the definition of the Superfund site is very elastic and it includes anywhere where the site contaminants are and are coming from. But I understand your concern, which is a very specific one, having to do with the state brownfields law and how that interacts. Yeah, and absolutely. I earlier yeah. did tell you that I'm going to look I, into that and see if there's something that we can help in some way. I don't know that we can, but I'll see what we can do. Yeah, because we're voluntarily applying for the brownfield to clean up the property, right. and we're not allowed to because EPA declared the property a Superfund site recently, which wasn't done when the Superfund site became into effect in 2010. That is correct. My other question is, it's a beautiful picture of my building that says, save me, but what about my business that's been in business for 47 years on the same property? My tenants, my employees, our families, what's gonna happen with that? Because New York City hasn't really done anything to approach us or notify us. The only thing they did was go after the movie studios and relocate them or try to relocate them. But as far as everybody else is concerned, they could really care less. So clearly, if the, if the city of New York is going to purchase your property either through a voluntary sale or through eminent domain, they are going to be obliged to pay the fair market value of the property, which I believe includes the fair market value of the business. I'm not an expert in this area, but that is, I mean, again, when, when we made our a hypothesis about where the city would put the tank. We imagined it would go into the park because we knew the park had to be dug out anyhow and the city owned it and it wouldn't have to buy it. But again, for the reasons that you've heard here this evening and in past meetings, there was strong opposition to that and the city for its own reasons said, no, we're going to go to this property. EPA does not dictate to a municipality like the city of New York where they can do what they need to do. We can dictate that they need to do it, but we can't dictate where and exactly how they're going to do it. And so that is, I'm afraid to say, that that is a, uh, a disagreement that you're going to have to, or, dis or a matter that you're going to need to discuss with the city when the time comes. They're, they're not, they haven't started that eminent domain process yet, but I think you told me. No, there's a hearing on November 27th. You told me 27th, that there's a, yeah. an actual hearing that's coming up in a couple of the weeks. The first hearing is on November 27th. Right. And that's their first step into taking out the property, you know. And, and we also know that that facade that you have the photograph of there is a, is a architecturally very beautiful facade. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are sensitive to the interests that you, but also the community might have in terms of trying to protect that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the reason we have the city doing the dual designs for the property that you own and the adjacent property, but also for the property on the park, is that the city is under strict time deadlines to accomplish the, the acquisition of the properties, that, of your property and that of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, if the city fails to do that, then there comes a moment where the deadline has reached, and then they've got to switch gears and focus on the other location. Is there any way that could happen prior to them meeting the, the deadline for the final decision? Under the arrangement that we have with the city, we've given them a certain deadline, which I believe is April of 2020, and by that time they have to acquire the property. And if they don't, then they're automatically switched over to the other location. So that's still some time away, but it's also a complicated process, and so they have a lot of steps to go through, and in fact, they have to work with you. Now, you and I have spoken. Why don't we let some of the other folks yeah, uh, I'm ask Yeah, I'm going to ask somebody else. Okay? One more question. The wall that's going to be built, is yes. that going to be built from the canal or from the property? Well, so there's two questions there. Where is it going to be located? It's going to be located in what's now water, but it's going to stick out by about a foot and a half, I think. Is that right? Two feet from what's now the edge of the land. They, are they going to be built from the water or from the land? Do we know? From the water. Okay, so Chris is telling me they're going to build it from the water. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn Ferguson. I am a resident of Gowanus Houses, a member of Turning the Tide, which is under the umbrella of Fifth Avenue Committee, and we are an environmental justice group. So, my question, my question is, is that um, for the residents that live in District 33, we already have like plumbing installed and stuff like that underground that sustains our community with these new affordable housing being built and other you know entities that they're putting into district 33 so my question is how is the EPA determining who is burdening burdening our sewer infrastructure in regards to new development and how can you propose that all new development over a certain amount of units must have a big must have a bio disager on site to handle their own waste so that the new development does not further pollute the canal. So I, yeah. so I, I understand the question and it's an excellent one. Um, and now I'm gonna have to play the bureaucrat and I'm sorry. So the first thing I'll say is that the federal government doesn't manage or have we have very, very little control over local land use decisions. Those decisions are the purview of the City of New York, the City of New York Planning Commission, the, the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, which manages the sewage system. Uh, we know that there are concerns about the sewer system already being overloaded, the, uh, the flooding that happens, the backing up of sewage and things of that sort. We can try and be helpful. We can try and um, uh, play the role of, a, of a, a facilitator and try and make sure that the, that the local agencies are dealing with your group and others who are concerned. But I'm afraid to say that we do not have the authority to do exactly what you just said. And even, to get even more bureaucratic about it, and I apologize, within, within the EPA, there are different programs. We run the Superfund program, which is doing this work, and we do not actually run the water, I don't run the water pollution program. They have colleagues who do that. Uh, they may be more directly involved in make, they are more directly involved in ensuring that the sewage system that exists mm -hmm. is improved and brought up to specifications. Now it doesn't do what you have just outlined, which is to ensure that every new development has enough on-site Treatment capacity. I think that's how I understood what you were saying. Is that right? Is that yeah, what that, your proposal? Yeah, because it's putting a burden on the system that's yeah. already in place. And what is happening now is that um, not only Gowanus houses, but White and Warren, we've seen a decrease 
in our water flow. So like normally when we would wash the dishes or oh, flush so you're out talking, toilet, you're talking about drinking water, like, right? Right. The flow is low and so is our electricity. Like they're like um, putting limits on it. Like the lights are not as bright as they were. We can't flush the toilets like we were like once able to. We have to like fill buckets of water and pour in the toilet. So it's like I'm just like trying to figure out, is it being rerouted? Like, how are you going to sustain yeah. these new buildings? So that seems to be the wait, drinking water system, yeah. Wait, so let me just bring up this follow-up question. So it's like um, 0034 is a unique combined sewer because it actually receives waste from two directions, right? And there is a significant new development already here and proposed through the rezoning of Gowanus. That is further burn, burdening this, this outfill, outfall. So uh, what can be done to offset the burden on the 003 sewer shed, and can some of the sewers be rerouted to other less burdened CSO drainage areas? So it's like, it's still a backup to my first question because this still all relates to the Gowanus Canal you know, and the clean So again, we, we have a colleague here from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, I don't know that it's your particular job, but it is the, the job of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection to deal with not only the sewage, but also the, the water that comes into your faucet, the drinking water that you use to wash yeah, and Yeah, but cook it's with. still related to the go So both of those now. have to be done. The, the city is under obligation to do a whole variety of steps that are intended to reduce the amount of stuff that gets into the sewer so that the sewer has more capacity. And they're also under obligation, or they, they, they have an obligation which we are working with them about to clean the sewers more frequently. Because if you have a big pipe and a third of it or a quarter of it or half of it is filled up with dirt, the pipe can't carry as much. So it needs to be cleaned out regularly so the pipe can carry more stuff and get it out of the way. But these are, un these are matters that really the New York City is obliged to do, and that's their obligation. I would encourage you to, and we can try and help, to uh, have contact with the city DEP. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Don't rush me, bro. Don't rush me. <laughs> Word. There you go. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joanne Brown, and I sit on Community Board 6, and I'm also a CAG. I, I'm, and I'm also a volunteer with Erica Adams, okay? And I'm also with the Fifth Avenue Committee, and also a Ferry, okay? My question is, I got three different ones. See, I live in Warren Street, and then right now, by you digging over, over here, doing your EPA and all this here digging going on, we have like a lot of flooding going on in our development over there. So now, by you doing this here super fun and all this here digging and, and what's going on here, but then do the national grid have any access about what's, about how that they can be able to go underground or either however they can do to help the city out to make sure that none of this raw sewage is coming back up into people's apartment. Because down on the ground floor, that's what's been going on in the apartment that was already in my building, okay? There was a lot of raw sewage, and by y'all digging and going on, that's what's going on across that street. Because they took them out the flooding and whatever. Every time it rains, like a real serious heavy rain, that's when, that's when they get a lot of raw sewage coming up in their bathtubs, their toilets, and then it's coming all the way out to the front door, okay? And that stuff do really do smell. And then my next question, down here next to the um, Whole Foods, the Whole Foods, right? Okay, well, while you're doing that cleaning over there, there's a bad smell. And then all that dust and stuff, whatever that dumb chemicals are, I have a scream in my window. And if you can see the dust that's on that, on that screen, and then I'm like, I'm smelling it, yes, I'm asthmatic, and I'm not quite sure there's a lot of other people, they are asthmatic as well. But then every time I start smelling that smell, I have to go and get on my machine, okay? And then I have to go and clean out my screen that's in that window because of that bad smell, okay? And then my third question. Now, Ms. Bell, well, our Bell Esquires, she, she said also too, now with this here funding that's going to go, that she put in place, rather regarding um, hiring people that's in the community, okay? Now make sure that it don't be like certain people that you put in the community. Make sure that you 
reach out to the people that live in this city developments that's around here that got a little bit of knowledge of what's going on here. So we need them to be able to be a part of what's going to be working and who's going to be working and make sure that, that it will be like a fair a fair across the, across the board, not certain people. I don't want to see, oh, well, just one color, and I'm not prejudiced either, okay? All right, there you go. But I'm just saying, I want to be like a, a round the board, not colorist, you know what I'm saying? Very colorist, okay? So rather that people can be able to be a part of what's going on, because that's what we are doing right now. We're being a part of what's happening right now, but we want it to be a success, but not be left out at the same time, okay? Okay, I'm looking at all this stuff that you did in all this here community, get all these big old beautiful condominiums come up, but then but we don't have no laundromats and we don't have no no real grocery stores and all this stuff. You're leaving out our, our elderly people. You understand what I'm saying? I need y'all to reach out and then help us as well because there's a lot of elderly people that's out here that need to be having to go to the laundromat, not walk three and four blocks down the down the road there, okay? But I need you to build real look out for them as well and all, the, and all of the sick people. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. So there were three questions there. I'll take them in reverse order. The job training that we do is focused on local people and it's focused on people who are, who've had a really difficult time getting employment. People who've been incarcerated in jail, people who've had problems with drugs or alcohol, and who are trying to get their lives back together. Those are the people that we focus on when we do the Job Training Institute. And that's exactly who we're gonna be looking for, and they are gonna be people from the area. Uh, and the local community is gonna be involved, a, some appropriate organization, and there are a couple of them here, they're gonna be involved in helping to select the people who will get into that program. Good. That's one of the questions. This previous question was, what about the odor from the 4th Street Canal uh, Basin work. Was that your question there? So the answer is yes, there's going to be some odor when you do some of this uh, dredging. The odors, uh, we, we do a lot, every time we do any dredging, we do a lot of air quality monitoring all around it. Right now in the 4th Street Turning Basin, we have five air quality monitors ringing the area. We're making sure that it's not unhealthy. However, if you're close by, there will time, come times where you smell like a petroleum oil. Yeah, it's like a petroleum odor, is that right? Yeah. That's what you're smelling is that coal tar. That's what you're smelling. And uh, unfortunately, there will be some odors. And you know, as, people, as, the, as the job moves into different areas, different areas will be affected by those odors. But we will always be monitoring to make sure that the air quality is still acceptable. The fact is, you can smell stuff at much, much, much lower levels than is dangerous, but it is going to be. It's going to sometimes be irritating, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yep. And the first, uh, and you know, as much as possible, we're going to. They'll, when one, if one can do work in colder months, that's better than if you do it in warmer months because it, it evaporates less. And there's things that can be done when we put the stuff into barges. You can make sure that there's still water on top of it so that the smell isn't getting out as much. But it will smell some. And your first question, I think, had to do again with the sewage backing up into the homes. I'm going to have to give the same question, the same answer that I gave to the previous person, which is that's really for the City of New York Department of Environmental Protection to deal with. But, but thank you for your, uh, thanks for your comments, and you'll be watching us, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, hello. Thanks, good night. <laughs> Hi, my name is Monica Underwood. Um, I live here in Wyckoff Gardens. I'm um, the chair of Fury. Um, we're turning the tie, the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice. My question is, um, can we do more outreach to public housing residents to get them involved in this process? And also, um, how will the tanks affect us health-wise? So, let me answer the second part first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Natalie to answer the first part. The tanks are actually going to improve very significantly the health and the well-being of people in this area. Because the purpose of the tanks is to dramatically reduce the amount of raw sewage, which is poop, right? That's going into the canal where you can smell it, where you can, you know, where it piles up there, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And, and you know better than anybody else that that's what goes on. When it's low tide, you've got bound, mounds of this stuff that are exposed. And so you're smelling it and it's obnoxious. That's what we're trying to prevent. 
All that's going to be dug away. It's all going to be removed. And we don't want it to come back again and again and again. So the tanks will improve overall health and well-being. Let me ask Natalie to respond to the question of how to get more outreach to the Gowanus and, Red and Wyckoff houses and Red Hook houses as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the uh, Gowanus Canal Community Advisory Group does have representation from Wyckoff, from Red Hook, fr from Warren Street, um, from Gowanus, mm -hmm. and from um, Red Hook houses. There are some members who I think who just left. There are actually members of Fury who are also part of the Gowanus com right. the, the Gowanus um, Community Advisory Group. Now, okay. you and I can talk a little bit later if you mm -hmm. have some other ideas for us to continue to engage with the community. We're more than willing, and we're welcome any kind of input that you can have. But there is currently representation mm -hmm. and we would like to encourage more and more people to come out. One of the me one yes. of the primary reasons for us having this meeting, particularly in this location, is to encourage participation from people for, with people from public housing and Good. anyone else who's interested in this project. Okay. Right? Thank yeah. you. you know, I've, I been, think I've been to um, two of your meetings with um, Beverly Coyben, so see? I will be continuing to come. Oh, we will, at... we will stay here <laughs> as long as I have a job. I mean, no, okay. we'll stay here as long as it takes to clean up the camp. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and meetings like this are a good way to do this, and we're going to we'll be ready to do this, this kind of a meeting you know, once a year, every year, to keep you updated on what's going on. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good, good evening. My name is Ijaza El Nawabin. And I'm, of, I'm a member of the uh, Neighborhood Coalition. I live in Gowanus, and I'm um, also a member of Fury. The, um, I want to piggyback off of what they were talking about earlier, and you had gave an answer that wasn't clear enough for me because I know that as far as this monitoring, um, I want to find out how you monitor all. No, it's about um, the pollution in the air and stuff like that. And I want to know how, because from what I understand, I mean, the smell is one thing. But when you're smelling something, you're also inhaling the contaminants. And that's what's going to be hurting people. And they may not be aware of this. So I want to find out what you're going to do to uh, in, you know, inform the people, educate the people, or show them how to protect themselves when they're smelling this stuff. Because the smell is, is, is really, you know, it's nothing compared to what they're inhaling. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. It actually is the case that you can smell this stuff at much lower levels than, than levels that would be dangerous to you. So the monitors that we have, and we have right now five of them around the 4th Street Basin where the work is going on, and anytime there's work going on, those monitors are running, and uh, they are looking at, let me just ask Christos if you can tell me, what exactly are they looking at? PAH is in the air? or what? Volatile organics, which is a whole category of, chem of chemicals. Volatile means they evaporate and you can smell them. You can also breathe them in. So what we want to make sure is that the amount that's being breathed in by people who would be spending, you know, 12 hours a day right next to, the, right next to where the work is going on, that that would still be okay, that they wouldn't be uh, adversely affected. Now, it's going to be, 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 there will be times where it's unpleasant. And if you find that it's unpleasant, or like this other lady said, if she has asthma and this tends to aggravate her asthma, the answer is try and be away from it. I mean, that would be just good common sense. But the levels that we are concerned about are those that would be dangerous if somebody continues to breed them in for longer periods of time. And that's what we are preventing. Now, if those monitors, by the way, the, the mo those monitors, there's five of them running, they're automatically uh, like over, like through a cell phone service, they're basically communicating to a, a control station, which is over by public place. And there's a person who there, his job is to watch those monitors, and if it triggers any alarms or triggers any excessive amounts, then the information has to go back to the people actually doing the work, and they gotta stop, they gotta figure out why it's happening, they gotta do something else to prevent it from getting worse. And so there is a, a, a feedback system of that sort that's in place. I understand the feedback, but what are you going to do to warn the people when this thing happens? The people in the, in the, uh, in the area should be warned. Yeah. As soon as the problem arises, we simply stop work until we can figure out what the problem was and fix it. 
In terms of warning, we don't feel that, I mean, other than to say to people, the work is going on and you can see it. I mean, when you walk outside, you can see if they're, if they're dredging, you'll see it happening, right? And at that point, if you're standing next to it or near it and you feel that you are uh, smelling an, an unpleasant smell that you're uncomfortable with, uh, obviously, it doesn't make sense for you to stay there. You, you want to get away, go indoors or get further away. Uh, but if there were ever a level where we would find that the air monitors are exceeding the amount that we are comfortable is safe, it's going to get shut down, and that's it. Chris, yeah. you want to add something? I, he has a question. I yeah, answer for one me? more, thi one okay. more thing on the same subject. Uh, we have workers who are on the barges. They are in the water, and they are doing that work. So we have to make sure that these workers uh, are not affected by the chemicals. So when the levels get high enough to be harmful for any human, uh, the, f uh, the first people that we uh, care about, they're the ones who are closest to, to the work, the workers. So we, have, we monitor their uh, air quality, and if that gets above you know, to levels that affect uh, the human health, we stop work, as Walter said, until we figure out. So it will never get to the point where uh, dangerous uh, uh, amounts of uh, chemicals will reach uh, the, further, the larger community. Okay. Yeah, I, I, believe me, I understand what you're saying, but it's still not answering my question because even though you're saying that you are going to be worried about the workers, which I understand the workers come first because they're trying to prevent things from happening to the rest of the community. But what are you going to do as far as warning community when something like this is leaking? Are you going to inform them to let them know that these particles are in the air much stronger than what they are? So I think that was the point that Chris was making. If it should ever happen that those safety levels are exceeded, then we just shut the project down right now. We don't continue working and therefore there's a warning at that point wouldn't be meaningful because the work will have already stopped. And so that's, I think, the point that, that Christos was trying to make. Exactly. The, you're, not, yeah, it, you're saying that a I, warning... I think the point is... No, I, I understand the question, but the, the point is that if it will never get to the point where it is a danger where you would have to give the warning because as soon as those very conservative levels are exceeded, if they are... But they're airborne. The work they're still stops. In the, they're, they're airborne. They're still in the air, so people are still. Right. They dissipate very, very quickly. Okay. They, they dissipate extremely quickly, and that's I think maybe that's the point that we weren't communicating properly about. They, as they dissipate really quickly, so as soon as you stop the work, then they dissipate. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When I say climate, you say justice. Climate. Justice. Climate. Justice. Climate. Okay, so I'm here as an organizer for Turning the Tide, which is an environmental justice group right here in South Brooklyn. And um, I heard what you said we do. We actually have 16 questions off the back of, you know, the top of our head that we actually printed and we gave a copy to Dan to give to Nydia. We will also give a copy to Natalie. Um, so, sure. So one of the things I heard you say is that these will be lessons learned for EPA, DEP, DEC. Well, what the people are saying is as you're learning your lessons, they want to be notified. Every single time those levels go, something escapes and gets into the atmosphere or et cetera, they want to know. So we have to devise some type of a signal or, or website where the people in this neighborhood could go and see your monitoring um, uh, 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 measures. That's number one. Number two, where can we find the maintenance and operation schedules for the catch basins? Sorry, I was just getting an answer to that question, and I think the answer okay, is yes, so we're going to put them on the website. So if this happens, we hope it's not going to happen, but if it happens, we're going to put the information on our website so everybody will know when it happened and where it happened. Is that good? Is yeah. that good for the people who are asking to know when there is a um, it, issue? It's not like we're gonna have you know, a siren alarm or something like that, and we don't believe we need it. That's not gonna be the case, but we will be providing the information. Wait a minute, can I talk? Yeah. You're saying that you don't believe you need it, but you don't live here. These are the people who live here. I understand. And they want it. 
So we have to work together yep. and we have to come to that agreement that you're going to listen, not just talk, but listen and comply with what they're asking for. It's not a big deal to give them warning, okay? We all make mistakes and nobody's perfect. You did say that when you started your presentation. So they're saying that they want you to show when you're making a mistake. They wanna know and they wanna be a part of the decision making and be notified, so that's number one. Number two, when we talk about the sewer um, incidents of, of overflow, there's 40 million gallons per overflow and your tanks will only be capturing 12 million gallons out of 40. So 28 other million gallons of raw sewage is still going in the canal. That's not acceptable for me because that's a half a job. And we're looking at a half a job with 28 million gallons and we're not even talking about the, the, um, the, um, the uh, growth in this community because it will be rezoned and we have seen a lot of big buildings go up including one getting ready to go up at 80 Flatbush. What they're concerned with is the fact that 0034 is one of the only outlets that actually receives poo from two directions already. So it's already overburdened. So now as you're building more and as sea level rises and climate change creates 500 year storms, which we just saw in Puerto Rico and in uh, Florida, they wanna know how, how are you going to make sure that that system is not overburdened especially putting enough underground tank in that's gonna be near the public housing residents. The third thing is value capture. With all of this work going on, these people in public housing, number one, you need to force public housing to put their sewer plugs in too, just like you do all of these individual homeowners that have been having the sewer backups that had to pay fifteen and twenty thousand dollars to get that device put in to keep the sewer out of their building. NYCHA is never a part of any of those requirements. So yeah, I live on the first floor in Red Hook and I'm constantly, I can't sit in my bathtub. I haven't sat in my bathtub in years. I gotta go to Jersey to my boyfriend's house. I can only take showers, because I would never put my body down in anything that got cold tar coming up in my bathroom. You know, so let's think about this. We are burdening communities that are already burdened. What they're saying is that they are willing to talk to you, they're willing to express their, um, their fears, but they want to be a part of this. They want to receive benefits to offset the burdens. And those benefits include you keeping them involved at the beginning. If you're monitoring things, then people from public housing should learn how that monitoring works. It shouldn't be a big secret. They should learn how that works. If you're dredging, people in public housing should learn how to dredge. If we putting in a billion oysters, people in public housing need to learn how to put in those billion oysters. That's what they're saying here. Thank you, and I'll give you a copy of the questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There was a whole bunch of questions there, and we will get answers to you. One thing that Christos mentioned to me, so right now, out of that, oh, out of the, uh, the combined sewer overflow, is there's about 130 million gallons a year of combined sewage, rainwater plus sewage, that goes into the canal. After these tanks are built, there'll still be some, but the amount will be about 11 million gallons. So we're going, that's on the cross the whole year. So we're going down from 130 million gallons down to about 11 million gallons. That's more than a 90% reduction in terms of the actual amount of stuff that's going into the water. And importantly, and I mentioned this earlier, the, what they call the first flush is always the dirtiest. So when the rain starts, and the water starts to go into the gutters and down into the pipes, and the pipe gets filled up, that's the moment when there's more sewage per, per section of pipe than later on. Later on, it's dominated by rainwater. So the worst stuff is going into the tanks first. So, so I would like to say that uh, we are on your side, and I'd like to say that we fought for this. It wasn't easy 
to uh, put in the plan the tanks in there. So we fought exactly for, so that you have the benefit of that uh, solution. Uh, with regards to the amounts, uh, Walter gave you some numbers. Another way to think about it is that right now there are uh, over 40 overflow events, I believe, per, per year. And by the time we finish the tanks, there will be only, uh, we will be capturing all of them but a few. And those few events, uh, they will only uh, be discharging uh, smaller quantities, uh, as Walter said earlier in the presentation, uh, the cleaner water uh, uh, that exists in, in the sewers. So we will be capturing most uh, of, of the overflow events, except for a few. Thank you. Um, I'm not a community person, <laughs> but I'm going to be reading um, some questions from some people who had to leave. Um, are there any health concerns around drinking or bathing in Gowanus residences or businesses? Where does fresh water come from? So the, when I, I presume the question means where does the water come from when you turn your tap right. on? That, has, that comes from 100 miles away. That comes from the Catskill and Delaware watershed 100 miles away. It is New York City water is some of the best water of any city, town, village, anywhere in the country. So you can be quite confident in your water supply. And the question was, are there any health concerns about drinking or bathing? Um, I guess it's the same. Oh, it's yeah. The same your bra I presume they don't mean bathing in the Kiwanis Canal. No, 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 no. no. I, I, I'm <laughs> but if you're drinking water in your home, if you're bathing. Now, this other lady had the problem that she was concerned that there's sewage backing up into her house. That's not the, the drinking water that's coming out of the tap. That's sewage coming back in. That's obviously a horrible situation and intoler intolerable. But if you do not have that situation, the, the water that's coming out of your tap is safe. Um, why do you feel it's safe to build new housing along the site now versus waiting until the canal is cleaned up or at least stabilized? That is an interesting land use question. It's not EPA's role or the federal government's role to tell the city of New York what can be built, where it can be built, or when it can be built. That is a local government decision. Um, why is it when EPA discusses, discusses the Fulton MGP site, they only reference Parcel 2 as contaminated and in need of remediation? EPA must remind public that there are multiple parcels in need of remediation, and part of the sewage tank excavation at alternative sites will remove additional MGP waste. That is exactly correct. In fact, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the site, there's actually eight different parcels that have been identified as being potentially or involved in the Fulton manufactured gas plant site. The gentleman over here who spoke earlier, his is one of those seven or eight sites. The portion underneath the, the swimming pool, that's another one. The property immediately south of this gentleman's property is another one. The property immediately south of that, which is where the, the film studio was, is that's another one. Uh, and then there's a long, I don't, know, I, can't, I don't know what the name of the street is, but opposite, uh, sort of south of the park, there are several more sites. All of those have con some amount of contamination on them. All of them have to be and will be eventually cleaned up. Uh, the, the parcels immediately adjacent to the canal, where the city is intending to build its tank, those will be cleaned up by National Grid in advance of the time the city builds the tank and other parcels will be cleaned up when those parcels are redeveloped. And that redevelopment is likely to take place earlier rather than later because of the, because of the pressure to redevelop the whole Gowanus area. Now that raises other questions about what kind of redevelopment do residents want. And again, that's a matter for the local planning commission and for the community and the community board and so forth to be involved in. Um, last question. Uh, will there be sewage smells associated with the CSO tanks? No. I, actually, I have a sewage, I have one of these mitigation tanks uh, living uh, right near where I live. I have one of these tanks. It's a 5 million gallon tank. It's not as big as the 8 million gallon tank. But in Flushing, there is a 50 million gallon tank that's already been built, and, these, and there's actually a park above it. There's a park with playing fields. There's a gymnasium in the same building where uh, some of the equipment that runs the tank is located, 
And I've been there, and it is, uh, the smells are managed very carefully. Um, well, that, that's it for the questions. Um, I just wanted to give a plug, Raphael asked me to, um, that... Uh, <laughs> no, no, not a plug for Raphael. <laughs> a plug for the Gowanus CAG. Um, the, if you, if, I'm going to give the email address. If people would like to ask questions of the CAG, it's Gowanus CAG FAQ, so that's Gowanus, G-O-W-A-N-U-S, C-A-G-F-A-Q at gmail.com, right? It's on the, uh, on the fact sheet that's on the back of the, uh, on the, on the back table. In addition, I'd like to encourage all of you to come to the monthly CAG meeting. The next meeting is next Tuesday, correct? Is that date correct? Or is it the Tuesday after? I'm not up for it. Oh, who, any CAG members who can tell me the exact date? The, the Tuesday after 28th. Thanksgiving um, at the, at the um, Mary Star of the Sea Senior Apartments on 1st, right? It's every, every fourth Tuesday of the month from 6.30 to 8.30. I'm usually there. Christos is there. And if you have much more intimate questions that you like to get answers to, we'll be there to answer your questions. And we really encourage people to be engaged as much as possible with this project. Thank you so much for so coming. Thank you to the CAG. Thank you to Congresswoman Velasquez. Appreciate your opportunity.